um, which is a very interesting time to, to join the Society of Friends, but she believed that churches should be separate from war, and um, so that's when she became a friend. My dad had been a friend his whole life, and they met in Germantown Meeting House, and from the moment of their meeting, as far as I know, until their, until his death, they disagreed about how that meeting happened. My mother claimed that my father jumped over a meeting house bench in his eagerness to meet her. <laughs> and he insisted that was not true and preposterous. Um, actually, her children actually think she was probably accurate, but anyway. Um, they met in Germantown meeting in 1945 when she went to, uh, came to Germantown Friends to teach, to be, to learn to teach. And she stayed connected to Germantown Friends from 1945 until her death um, this fall. Um, she um, stopped teaching full time, um, as many people in her generation did when she had children, but she continued to substitute teach and to do various other administrative stuff um, from then on. But my parents' um, love affair um, lasted um, they got married in 1948 after he returned from his relief work in Europe. And it uh, lasted through uh, for more than 50 years. Um, and if you ever saw them together, um, they were, he, she was often his foil. Um, and they just enjoyed each other's company tremendously. She, her role was, um, and she was actually pretty explicit about this, that her role was to keep the home fires burning so he could save the world. Um, and um, when he um, died, she felt, um, she continued to keep um, his light burning at, while she continued with her own life. She was a person who always had her own, own, own very active life. Um, it was a wonderful pair of role models to grow up with. And I'm gonna end by um, reading a poem that she, well, actually just the last two stanzas of a Lord Tennyson poem that she always quoted um, about when someone died. So um, in honor of her and my father, the last two stanzas of Crossing the Bar. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness of her well when I embark. For though from out are born of time and place, the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. Thank you, Dorothy. Mm. Mm. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's lecturer, Emma Jones Lapsansky Werner. She is an emeritus history professor from Haverford College and the emeritus curator of the Quaker collection there, though she continues to teach and consult with scholars and students there, um, especially with their interest in the uh, Quaker collections. She was studying history for her bachelor's degree at the University of Pennsylvania when she took a one-year break to join the Delta Ministry of the National Council of Churches and their work in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. She returned and did graduate and then went on to pursue her doctorate in um, American Civilization from the University of Pennsylvania as well. Her research interests have included Quaker history, African American history, and the intersection between those two. She's also interested in Pennsylvania history, the American West, and material culture. Some of her many publications, or some of her most recent ones, include Quaker Aesthetics, Back to Africa, Benjamin Coates, and the American Colonization Movement. She is a contributing author to the Oxford Handbook of Quaker Studies and to Quakers and Abolition. Lapsansky-Warner has also co-authored a college text on African-American history and is a co-author on the Pearson Education High School American History text. She regularly consults to museums and to pre-collegiate curriculum developers on enriching and enlivening public history and classroom history presentations. She's currently at work on three projects, a history of a Bryn Mawr Quaker family, a study of a mid-20th century Philadelphia multicultural intentional community, and a culture on the Quakers' transition period after the death of the 17th century founding generation. That'll be published by Penn State University Press. 
Having been an active member of the Organization of American Historians and the Friends Historical Association, a board member of the Library Company of Philadelphia, and a past board member of Friends Central School, she currently teaches Quaker history and first year writing at Haverford College. She's the parent of three Friends School alums, a member of the Lansdowne Monthly Meeting, where she served as member of their school oversight committee. And on a personal note, I'd like to share that I first encountered Emma through um, the Friends Association on Higher Education. She's known as a steady, brilliant voice for justice, for truth-seeking, as an exemplary teacher, and as a warm, kind, and direct person. And it's a delight to um, have this opportunity to speak before she shares her message with us to um, let you know how glad I am that you took us up on our offer to be a lecturer tonight. It's you. <laughs> I can reread the bio. <laughs> Friends, it's been our practice to settle into a worshipful silence and then allow our speakers to speak from that silence when they're ready. So if you'll join me, let's please um, settle into appreciative worship together. grateful to be here, um, to have a captive audience for the things I like to think about, um, which is a fun way to spend an evening, at least for me. What's that? Are you on? I hope so. Okay. Am I on? Yeah. You yeah. 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 I couldn't tell. I, I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of what I'm going to say has been carved down for what I intended to say because what I intended to lay to title this talk, I was told was not quite dignified enough. I'm going to get back there anyway because I started with a title called Reading Other People's Mail. Um, and in some sense, that's probably what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the value of reading other people's mail um, and the uses of reading other people's mail. And then I'm going to encourage each of you, because I'm on a mission, to go home to your attic and to your grandparents' attic and get their mail and put it someplace where the rest of us who are warriors can read that mail. <laughs> um, because otherwise, the story doesn't get told. One of my favorite historians is Arthur Schomburg, who said, you can't tell the story of a culture until the scrolls of every kind of person are unfurled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know way more about Thomas Jefferson than we need to. <laughs> and <laughs> way less about your grandmother or your great-grandfather than we need to in order to get the picture together. So anyway, um, I'm going to say a few things today. Students who live with me know that I have a, an annoying habit of sort of stopping in mid-conversation and asking someone in the room, what do you think about what I just said? So beware. <laughs> this could come your way. Um, so that title is there. <coughs> Reading Other People's Mail is another title. And in fact, what you're going to get today is some portions of an article that I am working on with the help of wonderful student research assistants. We love those. And it's called Making Friends, um, Glimpses of a Pennsylvania Quaker Family. Um, and the intention is indeed to do a double meaning of the Making Friends. Um, and I took my inspiration from Massimo De Celio, who was a pioneer in Italian reunifica reunification in 1951. And he said, we have made Italy. Now we must make Italians. 
I'm going to make a similar case. Once you make Quakerism, then you have to make Quakers. You have to create a coterie of people who care enough about what Quakerism is and stands for, that they're willing to tell other people about it, and willing to try to get their kids on board as well. And so I'm going to do a little roaming around in that, in that question. I'm going to start one place. I'm going to roam around to a couple of other places. I'm going to try at the end to put it all together so it looks as if it's one piece, but it really isn't. So I'm going to start with a woman named Naomi McClanahan Morris, who was a 70-year-old Quaker. She was a matriarch of a family farm near Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And in the year 1881, My own phone is misbehaving. My, this I is no a good time to remind friends to turn to their phone off. <laughs> 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 exactly. All right, let's try it again. Um, so she's managing her farmhouse in Bryn Mawr in 1881. And she's bought a new cook stove. And she's bought a new fangled appliance to heat water in the bathroom. The woman is modernizing. Um, and in my way of talking about modernization with students, I often say that, that one of the things that begins to happen at the end of the 19th century is that we move from people running machines, from people doing things manually, to people running machines that do things. And in our own lives, we've moved to machines running machines, that there's a kind of process there. Um, so she's got a new cook stove, and she's got a newfangled appliance to heat water in the bathroom. And she's entertaining dozens of family and family members and friends, some of whom, like George Vaux, arrived with three children, a nurse, and four horses to spend the summer. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure that this is the house she lived in. It's the house that it's one of the houses on the Harriton. Uh, homestead in um, Bryn Mawr, but it's not the one from which we collected papers when we went to visit them in the early 1990s, and late 1990s, uh, and collected those papers. I am going to warn you that one of the things we did when we collected those papers was say to her, you know, I'd like to see everything you say about what you have at Bryn Mawr. And she said, well, we have receipts from um, the 1820s on, they never threw away anything. They were a big house, and just anything that they did, you would have thrown away, just pushed it upstairs. <laughs> so by the time it got to the attic, it was 120 years old. Um, and so we got to this attic, and there were the receipts from eggs they bought in 1859. Uh, and they said, you don't want this stuff, do you? And I said, oh, I think we do. <laughs> so we took this stuff home. It was not from this house, is the point. It was from a very different house, and I don't know really which house she lived in. And that's not germane to my story. So we took those receipts home. Both within and near her homestead that year, Naomi Morris oversaw her family's management of ubiquitous illnesses and the numerous deaths in the family during that year. Most, not all of them took place in her house, but some of them did. Most of the dying people ranged between 72 and 93 years old. But one of the hardest losses was an 18-year-old Casper Allen was described as never very strong. She oversaw the planting and harvesting of oats and hay, and the digging of potatoes, and the hauling of coal for winter use, all of this coming out of her, her journal. Her journal recorded this, and much more. Household routine and minutiae. And she noted in August that this was the year of her 50th wedding anniversary. Though her husband, Levi Morris, had died 13 years before, she remained aware that she'd been managing a Quaker household for a long time. Naomi's journal recorded farm production and agricultural schedules, cultivation, mosquitoes, harvesting. In December, she's threshing winter wheat. She also recorded constant medical events, asthma and tumors and rheumatism and measles. And she was fixated on the weather, on housework schedules, on an ultra family, on intra-family visits, on geography, on family celebrations and the economic struggles of caring for the visits of horses, and the enormous cost of caring for the household help needed to manage her mother. Okay, are you yawning yet? Mm -hmm. 
But her journal also recorded the fact that her community life extended beyond the boundaries of the farm. In July, when there was quite a large gathering of Quakers from several yearly meetings, she was interested to watch the gathering at Haverford to discuss higher education for women. Extended family member New York yearly meeting Quaker James Wood of Mount Kisco, who was intertwined with her family because the Hollingsworths reached over to both families. It is a family that some of you will be familiar. Um, he came and he stayed for a while. Um, the Wood family was linked to the Morris family via the Hollingsworth family, among others. No doubt Wood recounted to her the conference deliberations that would soon lead to the establishment of Bryn Mawr College, for which the Vauxes, who part of Naomi's and family, would build, donate a parcel of land. In June 1882, the discussions of the directions and needs of Quaker education surely continued when Alan Thomas and his wife, Isaac Sharpless and his wife, professors from Haverford College, um, came to visit, came to tea. And Naomi, whose homestead lay close to Pennsylvania Railroad's renowned main line, but had linked Philadelphia to Pittsburgh through the 1850s, also cast her eyes beyond Quaker communities as newspapers and news-bearing travelers came by. She also recorded in December, in September of 1881, the assassination of President James Garfield and her anxiety about a national community which reached such violence. Her life was full. That's her diary. So she keeps track of, of all these things. This is Garfield's death. Um, and she's keeping track of all of this in her journal. Um, fortunately, if you throw anything away, everything was on that third floor in the attic. So when we got there, it was there. Okay, next one. Her life was full of many things. Um, and I add this here just to remind us that in point of fact, the things we take advantage of, you know, where machines are doing this and somebody else is doing this. Some of us now can turn on our washing machine from our button outside in our car. Um, you know, she couldn't do that. She, she, was, she had to oversee this stuff. She had to be there. Um, so her life was full, but she was also part of a team that included her daughter, Emma Morris Shin, and her daughter's husband, James T. Shin, who helped manage the finances and her cousin George Vaux, who lived down the street. Um, so she was not alone in her household. These people had been steeped in a Quaker community life. The world she inhabited was the world of Philadelphia's religious society of Friends, a world outlined by historian Phil Benjamin's The Philadelphia Quakers in an Industrial Age. At the end of this, I have a list of stuff you can read. I know you all going to go home and read tonight, right? Um, <laughs> It was a world designed not only to nourish and support Quaker individuals and their families, but also to provide for the longevity of the Quaker community as a, as a whole. Last summer, I set a classroom full of students to reading the mail of the Quaker Coke family. As I said, I considered calling this talk, reading other people's mail. One student read the mail, read, read some of the mail, and at least I didn't have them read all, there's 2,500. Um, but one student, and I, I pointed them to the things I wanted. So I said, read Francis Coke and read Francis Reading Coke. So they, 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 they were familiar with what they were supposed to be reading. Um, one student entitled, entitled a paper that resulted from his research, The Road to Isolation. And then he went on to explore the importance of the, of the concept of a guarded education, where schools like West Town, which was started in 1799, could protect young minds and consciences from the distractions of the secular world. I want to suggest to you that the secular world is always and forever. And so when we're talking about raising Quaker children, or Quakers in a secular world, I'm talking about this secular world, the one we have now, and the one she had in 1881, and the one William Penton had in 1681. I'll get back to that one in a minute. <laughs> if I'm good, can I have Um, okay. The students who wrote about the road to isolation, which is an interesting way of looking at it, 
goes on to explore the importance of the concept of a garden education, where schools like West Point could protect young minds, while having upstanding Quaker adults mold their minds and their morals. Haverford College, after all, started in the 1830s, also assumed this role, partly to protect young Orthodox boys from the, tension, from the temptations of those other Quakers. Um, and that's a story That's a story that has its own meaning. It's a story we haven't explored very much because in many ways it's embarrassing to Quakers who have been spending time in graveyards fighting over things. It is embarrassing. It's troublesome. Um, but I think that when we begin to unravel that story and tell it, we're going to find it a fascinating piece of, of our history. Indeed, there's little validity. There is a little validity to that student's interpretation of isolation or installation as desirable for Quaker children child rearing. It's based upon the concept of community responsibility that had its, its beginnings two centuries before. And so I want to go back for a minute and there we go. Good. I want to go back for a minute and look at the uh, there, that's good. That's we don't want to go back. We want to go way back. Right, exactly. We're going to spend a couple minutes back here. Um, maybe a few minutes. I want to suggest that, in fact, as early as Quakers began to think about themselves as a community, they were wise enough to begin to think if we're going to have a community and if what we have found is true and real, then it's our job to model it so that our children and the next generation can figure it out too. They wanted people to figure it out not only because they wanted what they, what they had found to be continued, but also if their children didn't catch it, didn't get it, then maybe what they had figured out wasn't true at all. Mm -hmm. It either is real and therefore is visible to other, others beyond just ourselves, or else it maybe isn't real. And so as early as the 1680s, Quakers begin talking about Quaker schools, particularly parents begin talking about how we need to have schools where people will model for our kids what we're going to be true and help them figure it out, uh, and so on. And so as early as the 1680s, down here in this little space of Pennsylvania, there's a, there's a Quaker school. And its goal is to model for young people what it looks like to be a good Quaker. Um, people were anxious about this, extraordinarily anxious. Um, so anxious, in fact, that the head of that Quaker school um, began looking around at other Quakers and saying, you're not really a Quaker, you're not really a Quaker. And, and so begins something that those of you who do Quaker history will know as the Cupid and Split. Um, they're anxious about <coughs> making it work. They're particularly anxious about making it work because William Penn had the notion that we would start here and then in concentric circles move outward so that the place wouldn't get out of control. And in point of fact, there were people who were working against that, going out here and finding land and churches and sending their children out there, which they could do because they knew, as one historian has put it, they knew that if they kept their children home long enough, kept them home into their 20s, they could then send them out into the world and know that they would be safe because they had been protected. They had been, um, it's an interesting way to think about it. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but off to the side. It has to do partly with Quaker psychology, which says children are not born in, in sin, and you therefore do not, as the word of sin, have to beat the sin out of them. In fact, children are born innocent. And the job of parents is simply to protect them from the pollution of the world until they're strong enough to protect themselves. It's a very different way of thinking about childhood, very different way of thinking about parental responsibility, and it means that you can then let go of your kids and let them go places that they can take it with them inside them. They don't need a priest, they don't need, you know, they don't need anything. Um, so in 1681, when William Penn turned his holy experience, a few thousand adherents, adherents of the Religious Society of France, he hoped his experiment in religious community life would be broad and dynamic, um, and that he would be able to help the next generation catch hold of the indwelling Christ, whose guidance had been discerned by inward light, and a moral community could be nurtured and sheltered within a like-minded community. 
it was fragile from the start. Owing to Penn's openness to settlers of diverse backgrounds and beliefs, Quakers were soon outnumbered in their little outpost. And though the colony flourished economically, community cohesion was constantly under stress. The Keithian schism is one example. There, Keith trying to run schools, looking around, saying, there are not enough Quakers out there that look like I look what I what my students should see to look like. Um, I'm skipping some things because I'm watching time. Um, indeed, within Penn's lifetime, much of Penn's dream did get defined on the footprint of the young colony. Modern scholars continue to find new meanings in the mark left by early Pennsylvanians on the development of the American nation. For early Quakers quickly used the advantageous location and natural resources to create a vigorous economy and an international trade and a modern education system and a political consistency <coughs> with democratic contours. Yet the growth of Pennsylvania was not without stress. Um, Barry Levy, who described this thing, this family system, said that Quakers kept their children at home longer, then set them off at greater distances than other groups because they didn't need a priest or a parish. He talked about a very complex land management system. Um, and I really encourage anybody who's interested in Quaker family life to go back and look there. Um, a land management system that depended upon having large land holdings occupied, occupied by interlocking families, but scattered across vast expenses of geography. It's a different system than the Mormons used to protect their community and to grow young Mormons, <coughs> is to keep them here, send them out to do mission work, and come back. Quakers didn't do that. They did a different kind of land management system um, that consisted of, of quite a number of things, including uh, having huge land holdings, <coughs> giving a chunk of it to their, and it could be far from Philadelphia, giving a chunk of it to their sons upon marriage, marriage was legal. And then having their sons pay them and giving the money to their daughters. <laughs> the daughters then became money lenders. I mean, it's an interesting way to put it all together um, so that you have an expanded and interconnected family instead of breeding them and out across the land. Um, okay, we, we can talk more about that if you want to, but not right now. Um, There are a bunch of scholars who've looked at some of this early building of a, of a system, but Penn's sons didn't get it. <laughs> um, they did not follow their father's notion, um, and in fact, they and some of their friends got deeply involved in land schemes that were, for lack of a better word, predatory. Um, there are a few writers who have looked at this, and I really encourage you to sort of look at land development. There's a lot of those papers, there's wonderful stories about this. A lot of the papers that, that define those, those land deals, those unscrupulous land deals, are newly found and newly opened at the Historical Society <coughs> of Pennsylvania, and written about by a wonderful historian named David Maxey, um, who has looked at this project. Have you read some of this stuff? Wonderful. Um, saying, okay, it's way more complicated than Quakers were nice people who raised good kids. It's a lot more complicated than that. Because uh, William Penn doesn't quite, doesn't <coughs> um, Okay. Neither Specht, whom you'll look at later, and, jo and David Maxey, neither Specht has looked at what happens when Quaker kids moved across the Appalachian started new meetings on the other side of the Appalachian. It's family members from over here, and they knew what they were doing, except that sometimes people came from other places with letters of introduction that were maybe a little bit suspect by 1700, um, and would enter the meeting and then take on all that wonderful committee work. You know how we love it when somebody comes <laughs> and somebody to take on committee work. Um, they took on the committee work, and later it was discovered, oh, these people weren't who they said they were. Mm. They forged their letter of introduction, mm. and they slid in sideways. It's a way more complicated story. Mm. But anyway, in England, 
that the schools were schools were founded as early as the 1690s, um, and early instruction in the way of truth is what they had in mind. Also in the acquirements of useful languages and sciences and the necessary employments suitable to their age and strength. There's great concern about the suitability of teachers. This is a pulling from, from quarterly meeting records from England. And about adult examples. It's recommended, they said, for your respective meetings to take care to have some weighty suitable friends go and inspect the schools. The adults to whom children were ex exposed outside of school were also to be carefully screened. And this is again a quote from England in the 1690s. That special care be had that such children are fit for apprentices be put unto honest friends that they may be preserved in the way of truth, in habit, and in language, and encouraged to go to meetings, the contrary practice having often been seen of very ill consequence. And so let's put them where we know they will be safe. Penn himself had chartered the Quaker School in 1689, a school which continues to seek to nurture Quaker values in young people. Those Quaker values, as they came to it in the 1680s, they called something, they called a, qua a holy conversation, which is an interesting notion. Caught someone's eye right there. He spoke a holy conversation. You're wearing earrings and a black sweater, and I've seen you. Yes! <laughs> what do you suppose a holy conversation like? about it for a minute and then bow it and let somebody else say over if you can't do it. Let's think about it for a minute. This was a holy conversation. Sorry, I'm going to talk to all of you. Okay. <laughs> Carol and I know your name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think a, a, a holy conversation is really an elevated conversation. That is above and beyond the concerns of the two people having it. Absolutely. It is that. It is a conversation that's supposed to embrace high-minded things, but it's also supposed to define your life. So that the holy conversation, as they put it, was not just about words. It was about the way you lived your life. Um, he gave us a good start. It's about the way you lived your life. Uh, and it's the way that we eventually come to terms like weighty friend and recorded minister. And these are people that you knew because they live next door to you, they live on the same compound, you know that they're behaving in ways that make you admire uh, and make you think, oh, I want my kid to be like that. You know? Um, I'll come back to that question. But the holy conversation, the term holy conversation, came early. Um, and it had a way, a, a, a dictated implicit instruction by loving parents, not coercion or strict that would lead to a child's salvation. Um, I know why you didn't get it. You know, it's, it's, it's not an easy concept. Um, so, so don't feel bad. It's not an easy concept. It's not just about words. It's about a particular posture that was supposed to pervade an adult's inward and outward life and was so palpable, as modern people describe it, that Quakerism could be caught, not taught. Word you, a concept you hear a lot these days. Quakerism should be caught, not taught. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a syndrome that you should pick up. Um, right. Okay. Um, this was consistent with early friends' notion that children born in innocence and not in sin needed guidance to protect them from external sin, rather than the Puritan notion that the sin already existed. Loving conversation, not violent punishment, was William Penn's recipe for child rearing. What Levy calls it is institutional surveillance, which I like a lot. <laughs> um, institutional surveillance came from monthly meetings, from families. Um, but the family and community and educational settings were and are crucial to having young people.
If schools were one way to nurture Quaker children, There's that map that by 1750. Here. Here. There are Quaker communities out there. How are you going to control them? And how are you going to do surveillance out there and out here? The only way to do surveillance is to make sure that the kids you send out there are carrying inside them your values. You've got no control over them. If schools, then, okay, are one way to nurture Quaker children, then another way was to surround them with other Quaker families, their cousins, their in-laws, their extended kin, were encouraged to live in close proximity to each other and to pass children around within extended families to be apprenticed or otherwise nurtured. Like when a child got to the place where it needed to learn some skills, send it over there to cousin so-and-so, and cousin so-and-so will not only teach them skills, but model for them how to behave with those skills. The network of families with which Naomi and Cunningham Morris was a part included a number of families, including Morris's, Wister's, Shin's, all of whom had come early to Penn's New World, and many of whom committed themselves to the maintenance of Quaker family and community life, as well as to philanthropy in the wider communities as well. They did so for generations to come. Thus, an examination of the life and family connections of Naomi McClendon and Morris offers an informative snapshot of the process of making Quaker. Naomi was born the daughter of Mary Thomas McClendon and Charles McClendon, and became the heir to the Harrington estate at the age of six weeks old, because her father died. So here she is, a six-week-old, with this weight of carrying Quakerism forward. Her grandfather, William Thomas, along with a few others, acted as her guardian. Not her, though her mother was still alive. Mm -hmm. And then she married Levi Morris in 1830. They lived in Center City until 1840. And then they moved to Naomi's Harrison Estate to a section of the family's holdings that had been the former life estates of patriarchs. I probably need to tell you just a tiny bit about this estate, which is that it had passed through several, several <coughs> linked Quaker hands. One of the hands that passed through was a Quaker from Maryland who came to Harrington bringing his slaves. Um, and there he was with the slaves. Um, one of these people, it may have been a slave, not a family, it's not clear, was a man named Cadoris, who ended up with a portion of the land to live on. <clears throat> uh, the next owner, after the owner from Maryland, was an abolitionist. And so the abolitionist probably ended slavery. There's a, there's a wonderful story in the grounds here, mm. um, which is a story I can't tell right now. I'm not sure I know all the pieces of it anyway. Um, anyway, Naomi and Levi moved there in 1840. And they had six children, three of whom survived. And after Levi's death in 1868, Naomi became the caretaker of the land she had inherited when she was six weeks old. Um, by that time, she is, maybe I'll tell you how old she was. She's about 45. Uh, and by that time, the farm had mills on it that were, pro that were producing income for the family. It had farms that were being um, um, rented out. So they had tenant farmers. Um, she had her own household to run. It's her job to manage all this. Though, in fact, her economy was largely managed, managed by her sons-in-law, George Fox III and James Thornton Shin, and her brothers in law so she has all this responsibility. It's not quite clear about how much power she had to work with the responsibility. Um, there's some squabbling in the family about her wanting to be appointed temporary, and I'm not really 
<laughs> but in any case, I'm sure that all of this is being seen by the next generation. At first blush, it would appear that these families expended scant energy examining or questioning their places in the universe. They seem to slip easily into the mantle of the religious society of friends. From their writings, it would appear that their contacts, behavior, loyalties, and pastimes are seamlessly shaped, branded, and reinforced their rootedness in the cultures of Delaware Valley. Long after Penn's death, descendants of his allies remain and remain today the standard bearers of a certain visionary, conscious, consciously patterned, community building, idealistic, but often isolated and insulated, Quaker's notion of social reform. Self absorbed, yet consistently valuing altruism, staunchly concerned with nonviolence, while stubbornly combative among themselves. <laughs> the profiles of members of these families have commonly been held up by Quakers and non-Quakers as embodying the American Quaker norm. Naomi's lifespan co coincides with the modernization of America, including modern banking, industry, and transportation systems. The train comes by the door, as well as with the Civil War. Um, and I'm going to stop here and tell you a little story about Naomi, about Naomi's family and the letters on how to present. Um, I love these letters. I love her, di her diary. I've been reading it and thinking about it, do things with it. Um, but I hand, I'm student assistants. And a couple of years ago, I handed the student assistants a box full of receipts. I thought, I'll make something of this. I came back the following week to meet with my research assistants, and they were so bored. They were just in pain. And I said, said you know, I, I don't care whether she bought eggs in 1849. Ask the receipts the question. Um, it's the business you were talking about. Let's teach them the tools rather than the facts. I said, go ask the, the receipts the question. I said, to do this. And one student went off and came back and said, I decided to look at these receipts and see how expenditures change when the patriarch died and the matriarch took over. Spending patterns change? I said, yes, that's a reasonable question. And he came back and went, looked at those questions. He came back with really interesting answer, which I will tell you in a minute. He also said, I also wanted to look and see how the city economy changed from before the war and after the war. Did their egg produce, did their egg purchases change? Did they buy in different places? Did it cost? I said, yes, this is what history is about. You know, people's lives change. Their, their, lives, their lives are not just things. Their, their lives are an interaction with the world around them. And that world around them tells you ways to think about the world you're in now. Um, so he came back, and he had interesting things to say, which I'm not going to tell you about. I'm going to But the challenges people now face after the Civil War, and after Haverford had emptied out because people went to the Civil War saying, Violence is bad, but slavery is worse. Um, and all the struggles, and the writing home about how they felt about that, and how they figured out, you know, Quakers are, are nice pacifists, they never fight. Well, you know, it's not something that happened. It's something they had to figure out. And in these letters writing home, you can hear them figuring it out. That's why we're reading other people's mail. That's how we want your, your grandparents' mail. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce you to another branch of the family. These letters are written in 18, oh, this letter is written in 1805 from Mary Drinker Cope to her sons Henry and Francis, who are students at West Town School, which had been established just six years before. When you arrived, there was already a, a uh, tradition there. <laughs> Looking at my friends who graduated in the 1950s. July 1805. Well, my dear children, here I am, left entirely alone, the parlor deserted by all but myself, while I remain sole, sovereign, and the solitary possessor thereof. Your grandmother has retired to Fairville. Your little sister, 
your father and cousin have fled I know not whither. Molly has slipped off somewhere with her lame foot, and Tillman is by this time perhaps asleep in the kitchen. Can I not then imagine my dear boys are here? She's writing to, to, to her two boys. They are nine and 11, so they're little kids away at school. I, I should tell you about Naomi, too, to go back to it for a minute. Naomi went to boarding school, went to a Quaker boarding school when she was nine. Because people are raising her without her parents. So these two are at West Ham. Um, can I not imagine, then, that my dear boys are here, and I enjoying their agreeable company? To one more interesting by far than all the recreations the world can offer. I might read, but books, though choice companions, would just now be cold and dry. An excerpt from this letter. It's a sweet, sweet letter. At least I think it is. She misses her boys. Have I not already painted you on either hand, nestling close to my side, as you were wont to do at West Ham? your hearts glowing and your eyes sparkling all the while with affectionate delight. Yes, tis thus I remember you. And while the picture I have drawn is still vividly imprinted in my mind, let me understand that I have parted from you, my dear children, with much regret. But we thought it not proper for your benefit or ours to express it. For though we should cherish tender feelings as one of the best, and most noble dis dis distinctions of our nature, yet we should not suffer our feelings to govern us, lest they betray us into weakness and inconsistency. When we feel conscious that we are sincerely desirous or acting for the best, and according to our judgment believe what we are doing is so, we should always endeavor to preserve a dignified composure, even under the severest trials. I'm a nine-year-old. I get it, Ma. I get it. <laughs> OK, it feels wrong. Well, this is hardly attainable. But by the strongest and most confiding sense of the presence and approbation of the divine being, and an entire trust in his overruling providence, which fails not to work good out of everything, or fails not to work good out of everything, to those who rely wholly on the arms of his power. She's not quoting to them from the Bible. She's not giving them a catechism. She's telling them, this is how you should live. And I'm living it, and I'm telling you about it. I speak now in allusion to those keen afflictions to which human nature is liable, and with which the life of man is sometimes checkered. Against these, my children, as well as every evil, the best antidote is a firm persuasion that they are necessary for our good for our final happiness. And who that have minds touched with the love and reverence of their creator and the belief in his goodness can think otherwise? Can you suppose that he who has created them with the most excellent, benevolent designs? Oh, that's not the one I wanted. Go forward. Here's the one I wanted in there. I shouldn't be in the Refuse to ennoble, to dignify, and raise to that eminence to be even worthy to add to his glory, whose very essence is love, who gave his beloved son to suffer pangs of ignominy, that by being placed in the same circumstances, they are liable he might show them an example of perfect excellence, and obtain triumphant bliss at, at last. Can you suppose, except for the purpose, purpose of bringing about good? No, surely not. See whether your mother or well, father wrote you letters like this when you were in charge when you were nine. But you know, you can see the same anxiety that drove George Keith in 1693 to drag this monk mother to say, my job is to make sure you understand what it what is your inheritance and the possibilities of your life. Um, and then she goes on, I strayed from my purpose. I meant to have told you about how I found the road better on my way home from visiting you. <laughs> I went to visit your little brother, and we stayed till fifth day. I don't know where the little brother is. And then took him with us, and 
attended Bradford meeting, and after that we took him along with us to Uncle Nathan's and cousin St. Regis, where we left him, taken back to his island. Okay. Kids being passed around to various people who are going to help shape him the way they want him shaped. Farewell, my dear children. These are the, this is a third child. This is not the one who was at West Town. Farewell, my dear children. It's too late to add more. But I am your ever and truly affectionate mother, Mary Cope. Mm -hmm. I think it's a sweet letter. Mm -hmm. That letter is in Haverford for anybody to read. You can read it online. You don't have to go there. There's a series of these wonderful letters to these boys at West Ham, dating from 1804 to about 1808. The ones from the kids are a riot. <laughs> Just if you're feeling sentimental, let go to this. <coughs> One son writes home and says, Mom, I'm really sorry I forgot to write about the oranges and thank you for the oranges. I know that if I said sent you, then you'd feel like you'd want to send me more oranges. I'm really sorry. I forgot to write about the oranges. You see my pen fell out the window and I said, <laughs> the window and I don't have to do I can write again. It's dark. <laughs> so the letters home from the kids are right. But you do get to see parents <coughs> trying to do their best to shape their children. And children kind of get this. Um, I, I didn't bring with me letters written by some of these kids as adults that are that re reflect exactly the same language, the same concepts. These parents mm -hmm. managed it. They got it. Um, okay. Um, we and Ben talked about it a lot. Let us now try what love will do. Um, but Talk to her kids about it. She said it. Um, all right. Now let's go back. Few modern writers have addressed the question. Harriet Heath. Oh, let's go forward one, not back. There we go. It's one of my favorites. Right? Harriet Heath, wife of a longtime Haverford psychology professor, Douglas Heath, has written about it about ways to view and manage young children in order to achieve integrity and morality in adults. And this is one of her recent books. I think it's as recent as, as 2011. Using your values to raise your child to be an adult being married. What an interesting way to think about it. You know, it's an interesting way to think about the child, the, the child rearing thing. And then back one more. And her husband, oh, there we go. We want to go to the seat. What Douglas Heath does is write about what happens. Douglas Heath interviews a whole bunch of people who were Haverford graduates. And he says, you know, some of them said, I got it. And I got it at Haverford. I figured out how to reach a path to maturity and success. It's a wonderful book. Um, he interviewed a bunch of people who said, this is how people modeled it for me. Who I needed to be. Um, and it's an interesting notion. I'm not suggesting that Quakers are the only ones who do this. I'm just suggesting that this is one particular technique for doing it. Um, these are grad Haverford graduates who had constructed, reinforced, and set their moral compasses from their Haverford education. Long before educational theorists codified the importance of early childhood education as a notion of head start. Quakers suspected the value of modeling certain behaviors and postures for children at their birth and protecting them from people who are modeling other kinds of behavior. The Mary G. and John R. Carey papers are also in Haverford. Um, and they describe the, the cataloger, I have not read these papers, I'll keep that because I haven't read them. The issues of domestic life and family relations, as well as attendance at meeting, are the focus of this collection of letters and documents relating to the intertwining Quaker families of Coke. Cope, Elkington, Evans, Garrett, Gilpin, Newland, Stokes, and Wall. Okay. Now, talking to you. The greatest number of letters are written by John Stokes between 1800 and 1858 to Hannah Smith, who would later become his wife. Haverford also holds voluminous correspondence between the adult steers. Oh, wonderful letters. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful letters between the adult steers and their child. Life would be better for catalogers and catalogers' assistants 
your brother Spears hand. <laughs> <laughs> but the students who read this handwriting, it takes them hours and hours and hours. It's going to take years for people to do it. Students who read the Spear papers come away transformed. Douglas Spear is still walking among us. Students struggle through that dreadful head drop handwriting at the end of the summer. They come away transfixed and transformed. Uh, my daughter was one of them. And Douglas Spear transformed her life. He was gone before she worked with Heather. But he worked on her life. It's, it's a fascinating process, reading other people's notes. He was writing to his daughter at Oberlin at the time. My daughter was an Oberlin student at Oberlin and was working in the Heather special collection. Um, last summer, when I taught the course, I had re students read some of the letters from Thomas M. Cope and ask them to speculate how parents' letters to these sons of West Ham might have influenced and shaped their lives. Um, the students who read these letters were transformed. Two of them came and went to work in special collections as having read, after having read a few Cope letters, sucked them in. Um, <laughs> so, you got your people working in those collections. Um, I asked them to look at the letters both in terms of what they could see in the past and in terms of what they could see in the present. Look at your own parents. Say, how do you know what your parents think is important? How, how did they transmit that to you? Did they tell it to you? Did they write to you? Did they model it for you? Think about that process. And how are you going to do it in the future? Do it your own. Douglas Spear still walks among us. Mary Cope still walks among us. One student focused her essay on the group dynamics visible through the letters of both the childhood and, exam and adult examples of Francis Reed Cope's correspondence. <coughs> Another student mused about the possible relationship between Francis Reed Cope's post-Civil War philanthropic efforts and the role models he saw in his Aunt Clementine, a school teacher, and his grandfather, Thomas Smith Cope, who was a founder of Haverford College and of the Institute for Colored Youth. The intertwining dynasties of Quaker philanthropists and businessmen and women were one of the narratives that were visible from reading other people's papers. Okay, I'm almost done, but first I want to know exactly what you're thinking right this moment, Maurice. <laughs> teacher Maurice, what's on your mind? <laughs> Huh. I was thinking about <coughs> my parents, in fact. It's good for you, good for us, that you and good for them. <laughs> and the variety of ways that uh, they affected me and my brother and my sister. And, um, not with many letters, although my father was a, a steady. Number of the Moral Ben Gunn collection, and you can go talk to her about that. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Jenny, what are you thinking right this moment? What I was thinking is I need to go to the shore and spend a few days with you. Yes, I'm going to argue with you about the white privilege thing. I think that we just don't have enough information. 
about that level of tenderness in other families. Yes. Um, well, what about the other thing I was going to say is that my grandmother's people are Scotch Irish, Presbyterian from Northern Ireland, who come to Philadelphia in the 1830s, and they also have a very similar pattern. They have land out near Pittsburgh in a village where half of the families are there farming. The other half are here going to the University of Pennsylvania doing whatever. And they're shipping kids and people back and forth. And their letters are full of affection and some arguments, but very happy. And they're very um, yeah, abolitionist and very staunchly Presbyterian. So I just, yeah, uh, yeah I don't, I'm, I'm not claiming that this is a, yeah, no, it's, is it's a unique thing. Interesting, it's it's interesting to think about how, how to do it, though. Uh, the Indiana people, did they come from North Carolina? Oh, yes, of course. Okay, because mm -hmm. the whole, the, the, there's a geography that goes with yeah, this yeah. as well. A few of and them the were Massachusetts first they came here. Right, but the geography from North Carolina to Indiana <coughs> is also an abolitionist geography, a yeah. Quaker Garnet geography. So there's a whole, um, I'm going to, I know, the time is going. People who need to go home should just get up and sit quietly on the door. <laughs> Uh, I, I tend to get excited about what I'm up to. Yes. yes. Um, but um, there's a geography that goes with it. And a couple of years ago, there are 2,500 in this book list. They're wonderful. A couple of years ago, and while I was still there, we started digitizing them. So you can see them online. You can see a photograph. You can see the page that I showed you. But you can also see a transcription so you can actually read the darn letter. Um, some of them. But a couple of years ago, another group of students took these letters and mapped them so you can tell who's writing to whom and where they're living and, and how far afield they are. And there's all kinds of things you can do with digital tools now. Get, get those letters to some, some, some yeah, repository. They're, they're 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 um, in the back, there's a, a nice smiling face. Um, I would like to remind folks that we are, are uh, live streaming. So if you'll wait until I get to you with the microphone. Oh, I didn't okay, see so who you were pointing to. Okay, I'm pointing to this person who's facial she was pointing to me. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking about my mother and how she intentionally raised me to have a certain sense of duty and mission and vocation in the world. And was and it how was or some other version? Say what? Was it a Quaker mother or some other version of mother? She calls herself an unofficial Quaker, but I became a Quaker when I was 13 as a convinced friend. Um, but she was a powerful spiritual influence. So she wasn't explicitly making Quakers, but she was about making spiritually deep, socially engaged children. Um, and she did it a lot through stories, a lot through um, lovingness, but also just answering questions in really profound ways and just always sort of guiding my attention back. Um, and it wasn't coercive, but it was, it was palpable. Yeah, like, and I, I think that the not coerciveness is the part that is consistent across Quaker communities. I'm not suggesting it isn't in other communities. But the not coerciveness is complicated because part of what the rest of the world said about Quakers was that Quaker children were, were um, undisciplined mm -hmm. because people didn't say to them, you know, sit down and shut up. <laughs> um, but the, 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 the whole lot of pieces go with that. The Quaker, Quaker children over time have it. I'm going to keep going because it's now 20 of 9 and I'm not quite done. So here we go. Steve and Betty Carey were generous with themselves. And so like many a person in the world, uh, one big slide here. Yes, I do. Just a moment. We don't remember where we are with this slide. I can scroll through so I tell you to stop. <laughs> okay, you've seen that. Okay, stay there. I think this is the last one. That's the last one. Good, that's where we were. Steve and Ben Carey <coughs> were generous with themselves. And so like many a person in the world, I feel deeply enriched by having been privileged to know Steve Carey. I loved it almost several times when he and Betty joined supper gatherings at my home in Lansdowne. 
and I loved it when he'd come to faculty lunch for me at Hamilton on occasion. And I loved it when he visited my Quaker classes, giving first-hand accounts of how he learned about acting out of conscience from his own father, who quit a job when he discovered that the company that employed him was supported by the war industry. I loved listening to Steve talk about Bayard Russell, one of my very favorite Quakers, and one of his favorite he talked about his own friendship with Rustin. And I'll come back to Rustin in a minute. I love watching my students' minds and their spirits expand just by breathing in the air in the room where Steve Carey worked. And I understand why we Quaker parents down through time have sought to have our children educated in the ether of giants like these. I love Steve's facility with words, his way of saying, lyri saying lyrically what I wished I had said, or what I stumbled around to try to say. I heard him say on more than one occasion that it wasn't, wasn't important to have everyone be a Quaker. But if we take Quakers, we're doing our jobs right, the Catholics around us would be better Catholics. The Jews around us would be better Jews. The Mormons and the Muslims would live more fully, completely, and compassionately in their own faith. And that this would be enough to bring about a peaceful world. My own parents were not Quakers. But they did inherit from, the, inherit from their parents and grandparents and handed down to their kids the tradition of making the sacrifices necessary to situate their children under the umbrella of bastions of integrity in hopes that the elusive essence of integrity would somehow stick. My great-grandparents remortgaged their house multiple times to put 12 children through college. My grandparents did the same for their four children. My parents did. And the great joke in my family is the year I pieced together an income to support tuitions for kids in Quaker schools by teaching full time at one institution, half time at two others, <laughs> consulting to Philadelphia School District and the Smithsonian, and selling Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite modern Quakers. I still have some of that Tupperware. <laughs> 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 Quakers is Bayard Russell, whose Quaker grandmother taught him the importance of living what you believe. I want to quote, I'm getting close to the end, I really am, I promise. One of my favorite, one of the things I liked about Bayard Russell, and it's the same thing I liked about Steve, wordsmiths, both of them. I'm going to quote a few of Bayard Russell's quotes. Hello Steve back there, now I can see. <laughs> the proof that one truly believes in one's actions. We need every community group, we need in every bay and community a group of angelic troublemakers. Uh -huh. Great line. <laughs> he also said the only way to reduce ugliness in the world is to reduce it in yourself. <laughs> <laughs> he also said, surely I must at all times attempt to obey the law of the state. But when the will of God and the will of the state conflict, I'm compelled to follow the will of God. He also said, and his biography is right out there. I saw it. I saw it. Go look for this man. He's wonderful. The principal factors which influenced my life are one, nonviolent tactics, two, constitutional means, three, democratic procedures, four, respect for human personality. Five, a belief that all people are one. My activism did not spring from being gay, or for that matter, from being black. Rather, it's rooted fundamentally in my Quaker upbringing and the values that were instilled in me by my grandparents who reared me. I like it that Steve and Byron are still among us, inviting and challenging us to do the best we can with the one wild and precious life we've been given. A couple of years ago, a good friend of mine wrote a new play celebrating Bayard Rustin. Uh, it's a wonderful new play. It's been read in many places. I don't think it's been performed yet. But it's nice to know that Bayard is still alive and among us. Um, and the nice thing about it is the, sort of the circles of the world we live in. That friend who wrote that play 
says that he learned about fire from me at a lunch in that lunchroom when Steve Carey was present. <laughs> They're all here. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, uh, I don't remember it, but he does. And so Brian Brussen had it in play. I like it that Quaker parents are still trying to make Quakers in our current version of a secular age. I'm done. <laughs>
All right. There was another hand right here with a thought. Yes. Thank you. I'm back on those sisters that got the money from their brother's farms uh -huh. and then became money lenders. I want to know more about them. <laughs> I'll just bet you do. <laughs> um, I wish I could give you some names and some short answers. Um, but if you email me, and I'm emailable, we actually have two more slides. If I'm emailable, um, and I can point you to people who have written about this. Karen Wolf is one of them. She's written about Quaker women, and their Further Women One is where Further Reading One. She, Karen Wolf is one who has written about this. And Meryl Smith. I was trying to remember her name. I've been trying to remember it for a long time. It's Meryl Smith. Meryl Smith has written about this. Um, and so there's stuff around to read about it. I, I can't give it to you off the top of my head, but email me. Okay. Yeah, these women are really interesting. One of the things that's interesting about it, too, um, is that, if I understand it correctly, the money was recycled through women. That is to say, you sold the land to your son, took the money and gave it to your, to your daughter, who then didn't have to marry. And many, uh, many Quaker, a, a higher proportion of Quaker women don't marry than in the, than in the uh, wider, person, right, wider world because they didn't have to. Uh, and because they had other things to do with their time and their lives. I mean, it's a really quite complicated trajectory. I, I, I couldn't go there in an hour. But it's a really interesting story. And I can sort of point you to places where you can go there. Um, a higher proportion of Quaker men don't marry than in the, you know, Quaker women, you know, I'm not talking about June and Sally, I'm talking about, a, you know, a bigger picture. A, a higher proportion of Quaker women don't marry at all or marry late. The ones who don't marry at all often do so, often re refrain from marriage because they have some other mission and because somebody has given them an economic place to not have to. Um, so it's a quite complex piece in the 19th century. There are bits of it trailing on over into the 20th, 20th, and I don't know where it is in the 21st century. I consider everything after 1950 to just be too complicated, so I don't go there. <laughs> Should I show the other slide as well? Uh, yeah, just so. Would you like us to put these two slides on the websites so people Absolutely. Can Please, that that's why they're there. Yeah. yeah, okay. They're just kind of a couple of things. If you go to David Maxey, uh, the Cope letters are there, and the Cope Evans project with the mapping, et cetera. Are, are there. Okay. Yes. So uh, this afternoon, I wrote to my. This afternoon, I wrote to my 17-year-old son to say I was coming to this lecture tonight, and I'm wondering, in the future, how will we read other people's email? Um, talk to the. Uh, I was just about to say exactly the same thing. Talk, talk to the CIA. Talk to the CIA on the one hand and talk to Google on the other. You know, um, I think that in, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this question, exactly this question. Um, I think historians in 50 years are going to be working on a different platform. They're going to be working on a different plateau. Um, it's certainly the case that Librarians have spent a fair amount of time in the last 10 years figuring out how to archive websites, um, how to archive digitized whatever. Because um, one of the things with digitized stuff, it's great. You know, it's available. You can see it. It's blah, 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 blah. But every three years, you've got to migrate it to some other thing. You know, Haverford Library has machines back there that were made in 2000, and they keep them in a closet because it's the only way to read stuff that was done back there unless you migrate it to something else. I mean, there's a whole lot of, it, it has way more impermanence than parchment. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, it's a good question. I don't have an answer. When you find one, text me. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's go here and then there. 
I, I was interested when you said, I, th I think something like um, Quakerism catches you, or you, 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 get, you catch it, I guess, in a sense. And, and I was thinking about that in the context of having been raised a Baptist and have, having a grandfather and two uncles on each side of my family who were Baptist ministers, having close-knit family that was very uh, loving and supportive in the ways that were really necessary to make uh, it possible for raising black kids in, in a segregated society grow toward full lives. And um, at some point, because I loved my grandfather so much and he admired him in the pulpit, I thought I'd be a Baptist minister when I grew up, but I fell away from all of that, but I didn't fall out of the possibilities of being caught or catching Quakerism, uh, which happened pretty late in my life, but I think the notion of modeling and growth from my family and me from myself to my students and to my own children um, was a part of the web that was catching me and making me come at some point through reflection of realizing who I am, um, really. And, I think, uh, I think so, that's right. And I think, that, and I think you're, you're right to remind me to make it clear that I don't think it's a, it's a uniquely Quaker thing. No. What I think is, makes the Quaker thing a unique phenomenon is the lack of a central authority. There's no, um, in some ways, there's no there there. Um, and so, Quaker parents are on their own in a way that a Baptist church offers you a little support. You know, catechism offers you a little support. Quaker families and Quaker meetings don't have, that's the word I'm looking for, they don't have a guidebook. The, the first Quaker I met Except for Harriet Heath. Was, was a teacher, a biology teacher of mine in, in the rather special boarding school that I went to. Uh, and he's the fiercest Quaker I've ever met. His beliefs were deeply believed and expressed. He went to jail for a while during the Second World War because he wasn't going to go into the war and that sort of thing. And that was a sort of early stimulus to... Um, and I think that's part of the being caught. Yeah. The part of the being caught is that a piece of Quaker faith, built into the faith, is a self-chosen lifestyle. A, 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 a desire not only for integrity, but also to stand outside whatever society is saying is the right thing and interrogating it. Not necessarily rejecting it, but at least interrogating it in a way that more traditional structures encourage you not to do. So One last thought. <laughs> my, my, Bay of Ruston in, entered my life in a way too when I was in college because before that 1963 march, there was a march organized on, into Washington to desegregate the schools, to actually push the Supreme Court's all deliberate speed notion into something real. Um, and Bayard Rustin was the chief organizer out of New York for that kind of thing, and I was the, the organizer on the Swarthmore campus when it happened. So Have I'd you say. seen Brother Outsider? Have you seen the film about him, Brother Outsider? Yes. I yeah, so you know, somebody said, he's the consummate organizer. He was really an organizer. He understood organizing. He, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so John's letting me know we're coming to the end of our time. I'll try to be brief. First, thanks for your presentation. Well, and thanks for, for inviting me and <laughs> to chat with people who care about this. One of the um, reflections that your, your talk of a guarded education um, revealed in me is that I'm realizing there was a time in my life in which I understood um, Quaker education, which has been largely influential over a few generations of my family um, living into Quakerism, 
but in my adolescence and in um, parts of my 20s, I had some judgment around independent schools and around that notion of the guarded education, which at that time in my life I interpreted as sheltered or overly protected um, and even you know, would have thought of it as almost these people are precious. And so I held some judgments. And in later years of my life, um, and in fact, it's highly coincidental because I was speaking with a colleague who remains a friend when we both worked at Aubrey Arboretum, which is the Thomas Pym Cope estate, and my office was in the Francis Cope house. So I, can, I sat where Mary was sitting when she wrote that letter to those boys, which is really fun to um, have evoked by you tonight. What I want to say is that that friend um, of Chilean descent, raising a large family, um, we were living just near to the Germantown Aubrey Arboretum, she talked about raising her children in such a way that they could be unguarded at home. She homeschooled most of them. And um, though not a Quaker, what that meant for her was unguarded from bullying, from teasing, from being belittled, um, not always having to go through an education structure that would mock them if they didn't have the right answer immediately, but also exposure to dangerous activities, predatory activities. And we, um, in that stage of our lives of having children, were celebrating that parenting philosophy together. And it helped me to see that the other side of the coin of guarded is allowing the young to be unguarded in a safe zone for that. And I've come to value that in a new way. And everything you tied together tonight helped me recognize that learning on my own part. And I wanted to thank you for it. Oh, okay. I had many things I was going to wrap up with. I didn't get to them. I stopped. <laughs> so. I do. I want to hear what you're thinking now. After I have pushed you into a corner. You, Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. That's what I want. That's what I intend to catch. What? I was uh, mortally embarrassed. Um, okay. I appreciated what you just said uh, about um, kids being unguarded uh, in a safe space, and I was thinking about my own childhood, where I walked to school by myself, half a mile, um, and I was out in the neighborhood. Um, and there was never any thought that I wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. And it just, it breaks my heart that that's so not true in so many places now. Not only is it not true, I mean, I guess it's not true. I, I used to take a tr two trolleys to school um, with my sister. But you'll be arrested now if you let your kid do that. You know, that's the thing that's hard about it is that it's, it, that, that it's now considered child abuse for you to walk to school. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a different secular world. Okay, I hope I stirred up some ideas. I hope Very I much so. sent you home to your attic. Uh, and I hope that there will be phones ringing in historical societies all over the Delaware Valley. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so that. very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.